their sins were completely covered by the mercy of God. And their obedience to the statutes of God was daily enriched by the grace of God. After all, what do priests do in the temple of God other than offer sacrifices for the people of God and even for themselves? But Zechariah and Elizabeth were not righteous in the eyes of others around them. God may have seen their faith and the mercy and grace that he had given to them as justification for their sins, but the people who lived around them, they saw their infertility as the justification for scorn and even derision. Surprised? This is not the way people look at infertility today. And so this text often gets misunderstood. Today, infertility is seen as a frustration and a disappointment. Couples who want to have children and who are working with doctors in order to make that happen are encouraged by their family and their friends. They are not treated as social outcasts, and certainly their infertility is not seen as a sign of their wickedness and rebellion. But listen again to what Elizabeth says at the end of the story. The Lord has taken away my reproach among people. Reproach is shame. Reproach is indignation. Reproach is disapproval. Elizabeth felt people were looking down on her because she could not have a child. Real or imagined. That's the way she felt. Of course, Elizabeth should have felt respect. She should have been honored by the people who are around her. Her husband was a priest in the order of Abijah, and she was descended from Aaron, the brother of Moses. They had a perfect religious pedigree, but Elizabeth was barren. And now she and her husband were both very old, and no children meant no blessing from God. And in the eyes of some, this actually disqualified them from the kingdom of God. Tonight, we consider the second of our four solas that we are looking at for this Advent that sum up the Reformation. Sola Scriptura we considered last week. By Scripture alone do we know God's will for our lives. The traditions of the church and the views and decisions of man, though helpful and sometimes holy, still need to be judged and corrected on the basis of God's Word. Only in Scriptures do we know the heart of God. Only in the Bible do we hear the voice of God speaking to us so that we will know His will for our lives. And what does God will for our lives? He wants us to hear His grace. He wants us to hear about the promised Messiah in the Old Testament and the Savior who came and fulfilled that promise in the New Testament. He wants us to learn about the forgiveness of sins and how He suffered and died on the cross and rose again to give us victory over sin, death, and the devil. He wants us to receive the righteousness that comes by faith. Grace alone is the second of the four solas. We are delivered from sin by grace alone. We cannot do any good works to earn our way to eternal life. There is not merit or worthiness in ourselves that affords God's pleasure. It is all given to us as a gift from God by grace alone. To illustrate this point, we need to look no further than the hopeless situa situation of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Elizabeth was barren, and now both she and her husband were too old to conceive. They would have to live out their remaining days childless and social outcasts. They would simply have to accept the scorn and derision of others who saw their lack of children 
as proof that God had removed his blessing from their lives. But then God breaks into the story. He opens Elizabeth's barren wound. He restores life to her body and her husband's body. They conceive and bear a son. God takes an impossible situation and turns it into a remarkable joy. Amazing grace. God gives the gift of life to those who counted their bodies as good as dead. He gives the gift of a son to those who had no hope of a son or a daughter in their life. And this gift, it meant that the reproach of God and all the people has been removed. In fact, it means that the reproach of God and all people has been removed from you and from me. Sin does make us all feel the reproach of God. It makes us feel bad, unworthy of our status in life. It makes us sense that we are social outcasts both before others and before God. We understand that we are not in a right relationship with God and we stand outside of His favor. And we can sense the scorn and derision of others. We know when people are looking at us and talking about our situation of life. Cannot people see our sin? Can they not sense our lack of discipline and self-control? Can they not tell when we are being selfish and uncaring? Do they not know that we fail to live up to the standards of God's holy word? Elizabeth's feelings may have been real or imagined. She may have only assumed the worst about those who noticed her situation. We do that sometimes. We assume the couple sitting at the table beside us, laughing with each other, they're really laughing at us. We read that post on the internet and get the sense that, hey, that was written about me. We feel condemned by others for our actions all the time. The reproach and shame we feel in the presence of God, despite all those others, that sense is very real. Look at the stories of the Bible. It's pretty uncomfortable being in the presence of a holy God. Isaiah blurted out, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I will dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King the Lord of hosts. Peter, in the great catch of fish, recognized as he stood before the Lord's own anointed, and he cried out, Depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. People feel uncomfortable in the presence of God. They feel the shame and reproach of their sins. They sense that God is holy, and they are not. That is why this Advent season is so important to us. We get to hear the salvation story again, how God comes to our rescue in the person of Jesus Christ our Lord. We get to hear about the birth of John the Baptist who would prepare the way of the Lord, get the people's hearts ready, and God's Word will get you ready for the Lord to come to you. We get to hear about Jesus, who was born for us in our salvation. He removes our sins and takes away our guilt. He gives His righteousness as His very own, and His grace empowers us to keep the commandments of God. At the end of this story, you have a very happy couple. Zachariah and Elizabeth are happy to be parents of a brand new baby boy. Who wouldn't be joyful at the birth of a child, especially in such circumstances? But you have to understand that Zachariah and Elizabeth are not just happy for themselves. They are happy because of the results for everyone. They heard what the angel said. Do not be afraid, Zachariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. 
And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Many will rejoice at his birth, says the angel. And not just brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews and other relatives, but even the whole world will rejoice at his birth. For this son isn't just for Zechariah and Elizabeth to enjoy, but this son will go before the Lord. Preparing the way of the Lord as he is given to. That's the Christmas joy. That's gospel joy. That is joy in the coming rescue of God of all people from the reproach of their sins. And all this is the doing of God. And this is the activity of a gracious God who wants, who desires to save you. From your sins. We are all saved only by grace alone. Just like Zechariah and Elizabeth, whose bodies were as good as dead to the hope of a baby boy, so too God has given life to our mortal bodies. As it is written, You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you used to walk, but God, being rich in mercy, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Grace means God gives the impossible gift. Grace means God accomplishes the impossible in your life. He removes the reproach of your sin. He removes everything that makes us uncomfortable with ourselves standing before a holy God. He removes our dishonor, our shame, our embarrassment because of our sins. And he allows us to stand fully as his redeemed children. Zechariah also receives this grace despite his lack of worth. God gives the gift of a son despite the doubts that rise in Zechariah's heart. He asks the question, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. This is the same question that Abraham asked the Lord when the Lord promised that he too would have a son who would inherit the land, the promised land. Abraham said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know? Abraham too was concerned about how God was going to fulfill his promise. But God fulfilled his promise nonetheless. So too with Zechariah. Zechariah is rebuked for his unbelief. But the very rebuke is to be a sign to strengthen his faith and to keep him silent until the day of the birth of his son. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. One can only imagine the comical scene that must have followed when Zechariah comes out of the temple and he gets ready to give the blessing and he raises his hand like he usually does, but he can't say anything. And so he gestures in a way to dismiss the people. There's also comical irony in the fact that Zechariah could not speak. It would give him more time to listen to the word of God to pay attention to the scriptures, to study and to meditate on what the Lord has given. With his mouth shut, his ears would be more open. We would be wise to do the same, which is stop with our questions and start with hearing God's word. And we should know that God will fulfill his promise. Even though we can't see how he's going to do it, he will fulfill what he has said he would do. God will give you and has given you his grace. God's grace is not dependent upon us, but upon God. That's why we call it God's grace. It belongs to him and it is his gift to give us. And sometimes we believe well enough. Sometimes we doubt. But God gives His grace despite that doubt. Martin Luther wrote in his most excellent book, The Bondage of the Will, 
Grace is freely given to the most undeserving and unworthy and is not obtained by any strenuous efforts, endeavors, or works, either small or great, not even by the efforts of the best and most honorable men who have sought and followed righteousness with a burning zeal. We are saved by grace alone. We cannot look to ourselves and our own accomplishments. We cannot even look to our own faith, nor should we focus on our doubts. Instead, we hear God's word. We hear it with our ears. God's word of promise. And we look to the one who gives his gift to remove the reproach of our sins. And in his grace, you are saved. In Jesus' name, amen.